Hi, I'm Dr. Tom Keeble. I'm the neuroscience communicator here at the Flora Institute of Neuroscience and Mental Health. Before he presented the 17th Kenneth B. Meyer lecture, I managed to sit down with Professor Carl Dasaroff and talk to him about his work, Clarity and Optogenetics. I'm going to be talking to Carl about his uh, recent breakthroughs, optogenetics and clarity, and what they mean for patients with various psychological disorders. Welcome to Melbourne, Carl. Thank you. Carl, you've developed a new technique called Clarity, which allows us to image the brain in its native 3D structure. Can you tell us a little bit more about Clarity and how it works? Yeah, it's a way of turning the brain transparent, and the way we do that is we remove all the lipids, or fats, and the reason that makes it transparent is that stops light from scattering in the brain uh, and allows photons or light particles to penetrate uh, all the way through. And now we had to do some uh, tricky business with some uh, chemical engineering tools to make that happen. You can't just remove all the fats or else the brain structure will collapse uh, and you'll lose all the information that's there. So what we had to do was build in place a, a sort of an infrastructure beforehand and we did that uh, with something called a hydrogel. In the end, the uh, brain is a, a very robust uh, uh, structure that can tolerate having all the, the fats removed. And uh, the end result is you can see through it and you can label uh, uh, different parts of it to study it in more detail. So up to now, we've imaged the brain by slicing it into sections, staining those sections to reveal individual cells and their connections to other cells. Uh, taking pictures of those sections down a microscope and then reconstructed them digitally into a 3D image. Now, Clarity allows us to do that all in one go. What are the advantages of this uh, over our current techniques? Well, as you might imagine, cutting it up uh, and putting it back together is uh, very time-consuming, expensive, laborious and damaging. And uh, there are also some fundamental issues with that reconstruction process. It's not always clear how to align things perfectly, especially when you're dealing with structures in the brain that may be uh, on the scale of one micron, one millionth of a meter. Uh, these are the axons that constitute long-range projections in the brain. So it's a way of getting around a lot of these fundamental problems and being confident of three-dimensional structure. One of the biggest opportunities is to look for uh, three-dimensional or volumetric uh, changes that might be present in the structure or wiring of the brain. Many people think that for neurological and psychiatric diseases that some of the most interesting uh, mysteries may lie in this uh, sort of three-dimensional uh, realm of the circuit. Uh, you know, are there loops, are there abnormal patterns of connectivity that could be uh, understood if one had the brain intact and could visualize it uh, uh, in its entirety. And we think actually already with some early work looking at autism, uh, brain samples and, and so on, that there might be some wiring differences that we can pick up by this method. Still very early, don't know for sure yet, but it's an interesting opportunity and we think uh, it's got a lot of potential. Speaking of autism, you're a practicing psychiatrist. Uh, what are your particular interests in the clinic? I focus on treatment-resistant depression and also autism spectrum disease. Uh, these are two things that interest me uh, and I they're, you know, I find them challenging, as do all of the physicians who treat these patients, and you know, would like to come up with better answers, which will start from better understanding. And so that really helps me, helps motivate me, uh, helps guide our laboratory research, which I spend most of my time on. And do your patients follow what you do in the lab? Are they interested in the um, potential future applications of your work? Well, it's interesting. The patients, of course, uh, these days they can all Google their doctors and find out what they're working on, and so they all know uh, what my lab is doing. And they ask a lot of good questions. They know, as well as we do, how little we really understand about psychiatry. And I think uh, just the fact that we're you know, taking new approaches gives them some hope. Uh, and. You know, I, I convey back to them that that is the real goal, is just to deepen our understanding and who knows what sort of treatment might come. But uh, I think they take comfort, uh, even in the midst of their suffering, from the, the fact that we're uh, reaching a deeper level of understanding. I'd like to ask you about your other recent breakthrough, optogenetics. Now, this is a way of controlling brain cells with light. So what are the advantages of optogenetics over our current methods of stimulating brain cells and circuits? Optogenetics is a way of bringing control uh, to a level of precision that lets one reach in and turn on or off individual kinds of cells with light 
um, even within a freely moving, freely behaving mammal. And this is a value because an electrode, for example, which you could use to stimulate the brain, uh, can't distinguish different kinds of cells, which may be right next to each other doing completely different or even oppositional things. Uh, and yet, if one could use a genetic trick and introduce a particular kind of light sensitivity into one kind of cell, you could then bathe the whole tissue in flashes of light and still be controlling just one kind of cell. So that's the essence of optogenetics. We introduce light sensitivity into particular kinds of cells by giving them a gene that encodes or directs the expression of a light-activated regulator of ion flow, basically, yeah. electricity. What has this ability to control individual brain cells taught us about more complex behaviors? We've been progressing in the complexity of the sorts of behaviors we're looking at. We started with very simple things, sleep-wake transitions, and that was interesting in its own right. We could play in patterns of activity into particular kinds of cells and look at sleep-wake transitions. We progressed to different kinds of motivated behaviors. Uh, now we're looking, uh, as you say, at social behaviors, and we can actually uh, turn on or off sociability uh, by playing in particular patterns of light. I think the long-term goal is to just extend those studies and deepen our understanding of, of a circuit basis for complex behaviors, which neurons play which roles, and, uh, and, and the causality of optogenetics, really knowing that this kind of cell is important. Uh, is just a really exciting uh, uh, avenue of research. So we're now starting to tease out complex behaviours by controlling individual brain cells and circuits. What are some of the future applications of this, uh, in particular looking to treat psychological disorders? A symptom like uh, hopelessness or severe anxiety, once you know which neural circuits really cause that, then it opens up many opportunities. Uh, you can screen for drugs uh, chemicals that might act on that pathway now that you have the confidence that that's the causal pathway. Or you might look at uh, brain stimulation treatments, which might be a, a, an electrical or a magnetic brain stimulation treatment. Uh, so really it's, it's just, a, I think many avenues uh, uh, open up once you understand, and that's the real goal. Your new techniques have been uh, a result of some fabulous collaborations between scientists with a range of different backgrounds. How do you make these collaborations so successful? I think you need uh, patience, you know, you need, uh, and you need to be willing to tolerate those awkward conversations when you have two people who don't even really speak the same scientific language. Uh, and we've done that a few times. We've put together molecular virologists with optics folks and chemical engineers with neuroscientists. And, and people don't necessarily understand why they're in the same room together and, and uh, they don't appreciate each other's language and, and skill set. But if you, if you have patience to get through that, you know, then uh, really amazing things can happen. And finally, Carl, I'd just like to ask, you've produced these amazing techniques, clarity and optogenetics that we've been talking about today. Uh, you've already won some really major science prizes uh, early in your career and um, these techniques are being used by neuroscientists all over the world. So what's left for you? What motivates you to come into the lab day after day? Um, is it really the hope of producing some more of this rock star science? Trying to do work that I think will help uh, our understanding and will help patients in the long run. Uh, I'm a basic neuroscientist. I'm enthralled by the mystery and the wonder of the, of the brain. And uh, you know, like all neuroscientists and all biologists, it's just a joy to come in and work on uh, our system and and study it and find answers, and that's, that's all we're doing. There's, a <laughs> there's not a lot of uh, rock in it, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's a lot of fun.